Imagine a human mission to the planets. To set foot on the dusty plains of Mars or the searing lava fields of Venus. To crash into the atmosphere of giant Jupiter and drift among the rings of Saturn. Such voyages might still be generations away, but we already know what a great adventure it could be. Over 160 robotic missions have now blazed trails to the planets, beaming back tantalizing pictures of exotic worlds. This is the story of the unsung human heroes behind those missions, and how they helped us to tell our story. to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. 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 The other things. President Kennedy's reference to the robots charged with blazing trails to the planets. And for 40 years they've explored our neighboring worlds, their missions overshadowed by more glamorous human space flights. Dave Scott was among the explorers who helped accomplish Kennedy's dream, commanding Apollo 15 to the moon. He was at the top of a vast pyramid of people that had made his mission possible. And we had at one point 400,000 people working on the program on a single objective, and it was not easy to do. And I think we missed it sometimes on Apollo by sharing only the successes and only the easy part, because it was very, very difficult. Six human missions eventually overcame these difficulties to reach the surface of the moon. Humans haven't set foot on another world now for over 30 years. Today's planetary explorers might not carry life or death drama of human spaceflight, but for those who've devoted their lives to these mechanical explorers, their missions are every bit as highly charged. You spend three plus years of your life working on these uh, incredibly complex machines. You put them on top of a launch vehicle that has a five times chance out of a hundred of blowing up. It's going to this poorly known environment for seven months and it's landing in four minutes and that's a do or die moment. You either are going to make it or you're not. In January 2004, NASA's Mars Exploration Rovers Spirit and Opportunity began their daring approach to Mars. Landing is the riskiest part of any planetary mission, but at this stage, the robot's on its own, and all the engineers can do is watch and wait. Parachute deploy has been detected. 18,000 feet, at this time the radar should be active. Heat shield separation, cell detected. Radar solution matrix 21. 3,000 feet. At this time, the red rocket has fired. We have confirmation the rocket have ignited. We are now awaiting confirmation of positive signals bouncing on the ground. Many of the people in this room had devoted their lives to these robotic missions, and confirmation of this safe touchdown was overwhelming for some of them. These unique collaborations between humans and machines have been behind every robotic mission that's ever left Earth. And it all began back in 1962. Venus, our nearest planet, was beckoning. Science fiction described a world teeming with life beneath the thick clouds, and many thought there'd be a welcoming party waiting on Venus when our first missions arrived. 
Back in the 1950s, a lot of people thought that Venus might be a place that looks sort of like this, a, a lush, forested place. There, there were a lot of competing ideas about what Venus might be like in the absence of any information. Remember, all we can see is those clouds looking from Earth, and people wondered what it might be like on the surface underneath those clouds. It was time to head for Venus, and Mariner 2 would lead the way. The Mariner spacecraft, now on its way to Venus, is the most intricate instrument in the history of space science. But the most intricate scientific instrument ever built was proving hard to control. And for the team whose careers depended on the mission, these were nail-biting times. Within a few weeks of launch, Mission Control had lost contact with the spacecraft completely. It was only by luck that contact was regained when the probe located Earth again on its own. Flying to the planets was turning out to be as much a game of chance as one of skill. There was some uh, fingernail biting on the way there, but then of course it flew by on December 14th, 1962 at a distance of 21,000 miles, flew right past Venus and the instruments worked perfectly and it gave us unambiguous evidence of a very, very hot and uh, dry surface uh, on a, a very alien planet. Venus was a furnace. The Mariner 2 results suggested that this was a very hot atmosphere indeed. But that wasn't all that Venus held in store for future visitors. By 1967, the Russians were ready to attempt a landing on the planet. They were going where no probe had gone before and weren't sure what they'd find. They planned to track their Venera 4 probe as it dropped through the Venusian clouds relaying its findings back home. And the pressure readings were going up and the temperature readings were going up and they hit a level that was about 18 times Earth surface pressure and then the reading stopped. And the Russians assumed that they had hit the ground. But we now know that what happened when the Soviets thought they hit the surface was that their spacecraft had imploded. The Nera 4 was crushed by the air pressures when still 20 kilometers above the surface. It was three more years before the Russians succeeded in reaching the surface. The Nera 7 only managed to transmit a brief signal before it died, but it had revealed what a descent through the Venusian atmosphere would be like. You'd look out the window, the first thing you'd see is that you'd be descending through thick clouds, but, but not dense clouds. In fact, it'd be more like a fog infinite fog that went on forever, but not a, not a dense cloud. You'd also go through some layers of extreme turbulence. Both gun systems are good. We know there's some layers with very smooth air and some layers where you'd get buffeted quite a bit, so you, you'd certainly feel that. Pressure increasing fourfold per second. So that's the launch you deploy. And then as you descended and made it through the bottom, of the clouds, the air is really quite free. Uh, there's a little bit of haze, but there, there's not very much dust or cloud or anything else. So you'd have 30 miles to descend there through, through relatively clear air. Russian perseverance eventually led to eight successful robotic landings on the surface of Venus. Four of them sent back tantalizing images. The first vistas from another planet fuzzy ones at first, and then on later missions, clearer color views. It remains the most extreme landscape ever to be photographed. There's nowhere on Earth that's really like Venus, but a cloudy desert is a good start. Everything in place, and then we'll move to the Venus site. Okay. With the actors suited up and the clouds also cooperating, they're ready to go. And after a bit of post-production to match it to what the Veneers saw, we're standing on Venus. Once you put on your hopefully well-designed suit, you're going to notice that the light is very different from anywhere else you've ever been because again you have those sort of perpetual sunset conditions because the light that filters down through those clouds and through the very thick atmosphere is that sort of diffuse red light. 
The air is very, very thick, of course. It wouldn't feel like wading through water. It's not that thick, but it might, you might feel, for instance, the breezes blowing. The breezes are very slight. We're talking a few meters per second. However, in that great thick air, a few meters per second would probably put up enough force that if you were walking against it, you might be wading, feel like you were wading upstream a little bit. This dense atmosphere is made mostly of carbon dioxide, a powerful greenhouse gas that's also responsible for the high temperatures down here too. Such extremes would not be good news for a fragile human frame. On the surface of Venus, you're under you know, 92 atmospheres of pressure compared to that on Earth. So 92 times as much pressure as you are when you're sitting in your front room now. Uh, and you've got, you've got ambient temperatures which will just cook you, pure and simple. And if you're not in your own enclosed habitat, if you're not in, a, in, in your own spacesuit, you're not going to last for more than a few seconds in, 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 in these remote and hostile environments. Venera 14 was the last robot to venture to the surface in the early 1980s. A decade later, NASA's Magellan probe returned to Venus and managed to map most of the planet from orbit using radar to see through the clouds. No doubt, future robotic missions will return to explore this volcanic surface further and to study the runaway greenhouse which has turned our neighboring planet into a nightmare world. reality of Venus is that conditions down there on the surface are so extreme the planet wouldn't be first on our list of places to send a person. But there's one planet that humans might just reach in the next 30 years or so, Mars. And the story of our exploration of the red planet is dominated by the hunt for alien life. 19th century astronomers had already seen evidence of canals on Mars through their telescopes. As late as the 1960s, US Air Force maps still had these channels marked on, and many people expected that we'd soon be meeting the Martians who'd built them. It was 1964 and NASA's Mariner 4 probe was dispatched to greet them. But interplanetary spacecraft were not reliable, and the team at Mission Control were bracing themselves for failure. When the first data started to reach Earth, everyone was taken by surprise. Yeah, data's coming in, boy. What are you doing in bed? But these first close-up views of Mars revealed a barren, cratered landscape. Although the flyby had been a complete success, there was huge disappointment at the dead Mars which Mariner 4 had revealed. Not only did it lack any sign of civilization, but there was very little atmosphere either. Just one hundredth of the atmospheric pressure of Earth. Martian atmospheric conditions can be simulated back on Earth by pumping most of the air out of this chamber. And as the pressure drops, some very strange things start to happen. Even at room temperature, the water quickly boils away once the air pressure in the chamber is pumped down to Martian levels. If Mariner 4 was right, then the surface of Mars was as dry and desolate as our own moon. Had Mars always been like this, scientists were determined to take another look. The view has changed dramatically on what Mars is like based on you know, the initial pictures from Mariner 4. Mariner 6 and Mariner 7 were uh, Mars uh, flyby missions. Mariner 8 ended up at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Mariner 9 went into orbit and actually started imaging things in more detail. The Viking missions in, in the late 70s, both two landers and two orbiters. Pathfinder, which put the Sojourner rover on the Martian surface. Mars Global Surveyor, that has been in orbit since 96. Mars Express could uh, look at the subsurface and tell us something about whether ice or water was down there. 
Now, of course, the uh, wondrous Mars Exploration Rovers. <laughs> Today, Mars is the most...